Good evening, everyone. I'm Richi Bhatia, and on behalf of the Guild Art Gallery and National Gallery of Modern Art, Mumbai, I would like to welcome you all and our esteemed speakers, Timothy Hyman, Sudhir Patwardhan, and Nancy Adajania, for this evening. Thank you for joining us on this very special evening to celebrate the art of Sudhir Patwardhan, one of the great artists of our times. We at the Guild are greatly honored to present and support this retrospective of Sudhir Patwardhan, curated by Nancy Adajania. I'm honored to introduce Nancy Adajania, a cultural theorist and independent curator based in Bombay. Adajania was the joint artistic director of the 9th Guanju Binale in 2012. She has curated many exhibitions that include the Earth's Heart Tone Out, Navjot Altaf, A Life in Art at National Gallery of Modern Art, Mumbai in 2018 and 19 in collaboration with the Guild Art Gallery. Adajanya has taught the curatorial practice course at the Salzburg International Summer Academy of Fine Arts in 2013 and 14. She was the Jura for Video, Film, New Media Fellowship Cycle of the Academy Scholes Solitude from 2015 to 2017. Adajanya has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writing on media art, public art, transcultural art, and the Binale culture from the Global South. She has lectured on these subjects at numerous venues, include, including Documenta 11 Castle, ZKM Karlsruhe, the Center for Curatorial Studies, Bard College, New York, and the third former West Research Congress, Vienna. She has recently edited two transdisciplinary anthologies, Some Things That Only Art Can Do, A Lexicon of Effective Knowledge, and Totems and Taboos, What Can and Cannot Be Done for the Raza Foundation in 2011, uh, 2017 and 18. Thank you. Uh, could I please uh, request Nancy to take this evening ahead? Thank you. Thank you, Richie. Um, and uh, both Sudhir and I are extremely happy to welcome Timothy Hyman uh, to both this exhibition and for this talk. Uh, Timothy Hyman, as we all know, um, uh, uh, he studied painting at the Slade. And uh, he's, uh, he's a well-known artist, as well as an art critic and, and, his, and historian. And he's had 10 solo shows in London. He's exhibited widely. Uh, his most recent book is called The World New Made, Figurative Painting in the 20th Century. And it includes uh, chapters on Binod Bihari Mukherjee and Bhupen Kakkar, alongside uh, other artists such as Beckman, uh, Leger, Balthus, and Gustin. And his pioneering monograph on Bhupen Kakkar was published in 1998. And um, uh, I actually have the monograph right here. I just thought I should bring it, you know, I mean, uh, bring it back into circulation, literally, uh, for, uh, you know, a, a new generation which perhaps may not be aware of this splendid monograph. I often uh, turn to it and read passages from it. And uh, I'd also like to add that Timothy, in a way, has been part of our zehen, uh, in what in Urdu, what we'd call zehen, which is our consciousness. In fact, I remember that in the early 1990s, uh, you know, with the onset of globalization, uh, when we had Western curators coming in, and uh, they wanted to make these large survey art shows. And uh, they'd, they'd start looking at our uh, various uh, artists' portfolios, and then uh, Immediately, you know, they'd have a problem because they think something is too Western or something is too Indian. And uh, Ranjit and I would always joke that, you know, this is the Timothy Hyman problem that we are discussing or the Timothy Hyman question that we are discussing. Because Timothy actually talks about, in, in his Bhupen Kakkar monograph, about how Bhupen uh, was trapped in a quandary because he was either seen as too Western to be Indian or too Indian to be, West, to be Western. And so therefore, you know, there are always lines from, you know, your book or things that you've said or through osmosis, uh, the discussions that you had with the Baroda School of Artists, uh, you know, uh, episodes, uh, you know, fr from those discussions or anecdotes, they, in a way, circulate across generations for us. So you're very much part of our, you know, thinking and our discourse. 
And as we all know, Timothy Hyman is, uh, uh, you know, has been a friend, friend and an ally of the Baroda School of Art, as well as uh, uh, also, it, uh, the, sorry, the Baroda, Baroda School of Painting and its expanded circle, which includes artists like Sudhir Patwardhan and Dalini Malani from Bombay as well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Timothy has written uh, various books, including uh, uh, Siennese painting, which he has dedicated to Ghulam Bhai, Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. And, and I think that th this is something that I've always warmed to about uh, Timothy's work, which is your transcultural reciprocity. Uh, you know, even when you came there earlier, because you came in the early 80s, this was even before globalization and before people were more aware about not othering the other. Uh, and and uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of those things uh, later. Um, so I don't want to lengthen the introduction, but I'm very happy to have you here. So uh, Timothy will now uh, you know, uh, talk a little bit about Sudhir's work, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you, Timothy. Well, <clears throat> when I first uh, was in correspondence with Sudhir, he suggested that we had a conversation. This gradually morphed into supposedly a lecture, but I wasn't having that. I didn't want that. And I, uh, <laughs> what, what I wanted really was a conversation. So. I want you as an audience to help me conspire, and Nancy too, where we, we somehow provoke Sudhir into talking as well. Um, and uh, I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of start with maybe 10 minutes or so looking at slides and so on, and then we'll start trying to cue him into a dialogue of some kind. So I was delighted when I first came in through the door here and saw that he'd named the, the I mean, I, had, I wasn't aware before that he'd given this interesting title, Walking Through Soul City. Nancy's title. Nancy's title. Ah, I see. <laughs> ah, I see. But in your, in, in there, you almost question the title. In, in, no, I don't question the title. I talk about uh, translation and, and the translation. I see, I see. I misunderstood. Okay. Um, but I, in that case, all the better, because I agree with Nancy that there, even if we don't call it metaphysical, it isn't straight realism. And I mean, I think that has to be taken on board straight away. And in fact, I've done something even worse in a way. I've, I've called my essay On the Altarpieces of Sudhir Patwadan. And it, it, you know, it's some, something of the same implication. And I've especially taken that as a key which indeed, when I saw the show, I do think is perhaps the key painting. I was, I was also very happy about it. And I'm struck how few of my Baroda contemporaries know that painting. Sheikh didn't know it at all. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know whether because it, it spent some time in London or somehow they didn't, they, they didn't know it. It was shown in Bombay and then... Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. So I saw it in London. I probably a few, a few of you here heard the earlier lecture uh, whatever it was, Wednesday. Um, but I, I came across it in London and sort of sank to my knees, rather. I, I had to ask for a chair because I was very moved by this picture straight away. And I, <clears throat> I had relatively few of the big pictures of Sudhir have I seen in the life. So it was, a, it was a, a, an exciting moment. And I think it's hung very interestingly here because of the curved walls. Um, he's slightly hinged the, the diptych you know, it's two panels. And so that makes it even more like an altarpiece. Um, so what I'm saying really is that when you see this retrospective, it's enormous. It's an enormous show, very various, very, in my mind, almost impossibly miscellaneous. It's hard to get a, th uh, a handle on. But one possible thread is are these big city pictures, not all of which are here. So I'll be showing a number of pictures which aren't in fact in the show as well. But the thread of these, whatever we like to call it, these pictures that have a world in them. I mean, this whole, this whole um, aspiration, whether we call it the masterpiece or the altarpiece, uh, is, is I think very present in him. And even if he sometimes um, moves towards intimacy and maybe a, a, a kind of picture that is more about the individual figure or even the self re more recently. I think that the, 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 the impact that comes through most strongly for me remains 
the, the, just that, walking through Seoul City. Now, when, you, when Nancy gave that title, we can come back to this, but I mean, isn't the implication also that Bombay is a specific Seoul City? You know, that, that, that it wouldn't be any old city. So, I mean, and London is certainly my sole city, you know, there, there, there's that as well. Um, I happened to hear on some uh, online discourse, uh, Sudia talking about that picture. And that's where he used, I mean, he used a number of interesting, he said that he talked about double-decker perspective, you see, which is a, a, something you'll find pretty often in this show, double-decker perspective, or another mezzanine world. I like that too. <laughs> but he also um, likened it to an altarpiece. So it isn't entirely... I mean, I'd already th thought in those terms, but he, but he really, he really uh, nailed it. And um, what he points out is that tr the traditional altarpiece is always centred on some iconic figure, whether it's Christ or a, a, a saint or the image of um, uh, a, a single, a single centred world and, and with different stories to either side. And I'm going to talk about that a bit in, in some detail. But you see here at the junction of these two big canvases is a void, actually. Essentially, it's, it's a nothing. And I mean, that's to me quite poignant that we, we have this aspiration, many of us, I think many, many artists that I know, have an aspiration towards a comprehensive, all-inclusive picture which creates their image of the world, not just a world, but the world, and it is somehow equivalent. What I really admire most in Sudhir Patwadan is the kind of, the propensity for making almost like a cosmic, um, diagram, you know, you, the, it matters what's on the left, what's on the right, what's above, what's below. I love all that. What I call it zoning. You know, he zones his best pictures. And I think it brings out um, a, a, very, uh, a very lucid um, uh, intelligence and invention in Sudia that he can't really bring to some of the more, the, the, the more modestly scaled pictures. But um, but with that aspiration, of course, there's something missing, and it's, it's there with all of us. We haven't got, most people in this room probably haven't got a settled faith. Someone said of Kafka, he never made an honest deposit into the bank of belief. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're all in that situation. Whether, I mean, I, I think Sudium would have started out as a hardline Marxist with absolute commitment to... Um, you know, doing away with the elixir of religion. But I suspect that something, some um, residue of, uh, of, partly from art, because the art we admire most is nearly all, a great deal of it is religious art. Um, and so I, my own feeling is that, you know, the, the overall sense of the exhibition, actually, is that this is, a, this is an artist who's part of the transition towards some new synthesis, whether we call it religion or not, which I hope will be, that's my hope, really, that at some point in the 21st century there may be a new kind of painting that, that breathes soul. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's have the next slide. I'll come back to this picture. Is somebody doing? Yeah. Okay. So just to suggest a few of the. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. A few of the the, the variations. Were were both Sudia and I are great admirers of Bruegel, um, and one of the obvious thing, most obvious things, which is present in the big pictures, that is much less present in the smaller ones, is deep space. Now, the world that Sudia grew up in, the, the Bombay progressives, was in a way at, under pressure to distance itself from academic art, from the kind of ghastly training that was going on at JJ school, for instance. Um, uh, yes? Yep. Col colonial, basically colonial academic art. 
I, I think by the time Studio was on the scene, and indeed I was on the scene, the enemy really wasn't academic art, it was academic abstract art to some extent, or academic formalism. It doesn't have to be abstract to be formalist. Um, so uh, I think we felt free to again penetrate into deep space. And that, that's uh, to me a rich, a rich possibility that it has opened up again in the 21st century. And you can see lots of young artists doing it without the slightest qualm. We had qualms. <laughs> but, but, yeah. uh, but, but uh, okay, so that's one. The Beckman on the right, which is one of the wonderful, I think wonderful triptychs that are made in his period of exile. He's a German who eventually gets trapped in occupied Amsterdam. So he's surrounded by his enemies who are the, the jackbooted conquerors of Amsterdam. Uh, it's a terribly uncomfortable position to be in. Uh, um, but so there he was, he was just lying low. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Thank you for doing, did you miss that one? Did you miss what I said? Uh, so Max Beckman, is, is painting in these, these, these very large triptychs in Amsterdam. Let's say the figures are about life size. And they, a contemporary writing about these pictures and close to Beckman called them post-Christian altarpieces. Okay, so I, I, that sort of gels with my, my feeling about it. Post-Christian altarpieces. Okay, the, the image on the left is Rivera in Mexico, I think all, all the, the big Mexican artists, I don't think you've been to Mexico, have no, you? I no, I haven't been either. And I believe that it's very different when, you know, it's it, it probably a lot more powerful when one sees it in the light. But the whole Mexican episode was very much left out of my art education. It was extremely unfashionable. And some, several of the leading figures just explicitly said, this isn't part of modern art. But I think it is part of modern art, and I think that, um, that there's still a challenge in what happened in Mexico. Shall I just say what, very briefly that Rivera had been part of the Picasso circle, a broadly, broadly Cubist, late Cubist in Paris. And in fact, um, he'd, shared, he'd shared living quarters with Mondrian. Uh, at some point, he had the call to return to Mexico and kind of be part of the post-Civil the post War New, New Deal. Um, and uh, he was granted a year and a half of travel in Italy as a preparation for this. So absolutely immersing himself in Italian fresco in the way that I think both Studio and I would quite like to do. We wouldn't, we would have been very well, if we'd at, at 35 or so had had a year a year's grace yeah. to look at, you know. So he, he was saturated in that. And he, it, it, it's obvious that that's his, his, his chief inspiration source, as well as leaving Paris, returning to his native land. Um, so indigenism maybe comes into the picture a bit too. I don't know whether it does with studio. Um, but um, if not indigenism, specificity, that we, we'd, we'd grown up in a, an art world that valued the universal above the specific. But the idea that one could speak, as it were, of the nation to the nation through art, we, we, that didn't seem so impossible for us. Even if you know, we, we didn't just have that existential despair or the feeling that one, um, all, all, all depiction was impossible. We, we, it was a different, a different mindset. And the, the fourth one is an, a pre-Renaissance altarpiece. So that's Simone Martini, who can be a very sophisticated artist, but he's doing something interesting there. He's, he's talking about a local saint who never became a full saint. He was what they called a beatus, a blessed, blessed Agostino. And he's standing there in the middle of what they call a vita icon. So um, it, it's not exactly, it is an altarpiece. I mean, it was an altarpiece, but it's for the life of a local, um, somebody he, he might well have met, someone who just died, and uh, after his death, miracles occurred. Um, and let's just have the next slide. Sorry. There's, there's one of the miracles. Can, oh, yes, I think you can see. Can you, perhaps, perhaps that's 
Oh, well, never mind. It's, it's such a little bit. Anyway, a child has fallen through one of those slats and it's been set on its feet. You'll have to, have to believe me. But So little domestic miracles, part of it. Then I've also, I don't know what's happened here, something, some odd curtailment. Anyway, there, there are these popular uplift posters of, say, Gandhi or other Indian leaders that certainly inspired Bhupen a bit. Um, and uh, there's one of Mrs. Gandhi, in fact, which I also had. Um, and uh, <coughs> something of that structure, maybe a residue of that structure, except, as I say, that there's, there's a missing center. And that's the poignancy for me, that the, the missing center, we, we haven't quite, I don't think Sudhir would be able very easily to put what, a single f dominant figure in the middle of his altarpiece. Another one. Another slide. Okay, so Bupen obviously had that structure in mind when he did this highly ironic picture called Man with Bouquet of Plastic Flowers, which I think has usually been interpreted by Gita Kapoor and others as uh, someone who's already died and who is in a way, um, uh, what we learn about is the living death of his his world. That again, somehow the, the image has lost its side. I'm sorry, but a bit late to say this, but never mind. There, there, there's a bit more to either side, but it's okay. Let's carry on. Another one? Yeah. Um, would, anyone, would either of you like to come in at this point? Just to say, I mean, on the altarpiece or masterpiece or Thank, thank you, Timothy. Uh, Sudhir, would you like to take up uh, Timothy's point about how uh, the, the void uh, at the center of Bailey's saga can't really be filled up by any single figure yeah. or a single icon? Yeah, I think in, in Bailey's saga that uh, the scaffolding on top and essentially the void in the center except for a small boy, boy squatting there. Uh, I wouldn't say it was like uh, consciously uh, structured as having to have a void. I would have loved to be able to put something there basically. But uh, with these two things on the side, one which I saw as a, 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 a an image, uh, a warm image of an old man and a woman and a child, and on the other side, an image of uh, some violence and someone having fallen. Uh, in between that, there wasn't really anything that, uh, so after doing the painting, I, I mean, I completed the painting and then I realized that there was nothing really, uh, except as I had put, the goings and comings of people. So it was basically like, this is how it is. Things will happen on good things, bad things will happen. People will come and go again. And, uh, and essentially, one has to live with you know, that emptiness at the center of contemporary life, in a sense. That's the, that's the sense. Nancy? And yet there is a little boy uh, sitting, uh, there's a little boy sitting there right at the center outside the house and there's a star, the star of Bethlehem. I mean, so there, there is something there. There's hope deferred, there's dystopia, but there's also some, th there are certain signifiers there which, which is often there in your work, which is even when the collective falls apart, there's still the hope that there will be something that will bring people together despite the various crises communal, uh, communal, of communalism, forces of communalism, or uh, other kinds of urban dystopic forces. Okay. Um, shall we just have one more slide then? Yeah. Um, I think that it would be wrong to suppose that, um, that Sudhir consciously um, stabbed in the back any of his, any of the previous generation that he'd admired. He certainly didn't. <laughs> uh, which might have happened much more probably in the West. You 
you see. I don't think, I think on the whole, the, the Indian sense of com a community of art is much more kindly. I mean, it regularly happens in England that if a, an elderly artist has a retrospective, he is torn to pieces. <laughs> it happened with Kitai, it happened to th even with Hodgkin to some extent. You know, artists who seem very secure are suddenly, is that all there is? You know? <laughs> We have more respect for I it, think yes. they have more, it's a, it's a gerontological society comparatively. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, it, it's a strange, I mean, I put that juxtaposition just because Taeb, a man of great integrity, um, and something of the, the sort of, the, the Taeb figures there, but with weird, slightly sexual overtones in this, this early drawing, 75, about 75, yeah. yeah. And um, possibly one other overtone is that the column that he has, I mean, in a way, I feel that's Leger somewhere, you see. And now this whole relation to Leger, I think, is fascinating and very revealing. Um, and one could have written more about it and so on. But let's have another, another, yeah. That's that early drawing called, just called Thinking of Leger. And he's, Sudia has said that Leger is the one artist I'm consistently drawn to all through his four decades. Um, that's the, the funny little drawing. Is that in the show? No, it's, no, it's not in the show, no. It's a, it's a slight thing in a way, but where uh, he's transported Leger. Let's have another one. Le Leger is associated with the bicycle team. So right at the end of his life, Leger makes these immensely explicit, um, un unambiguously figurative pictures on a grand scale. They really are, I mean, they're thwarted wall paintings. And you see, I think that the wall painting is, uh, to me at least, one of the possible solutions to the big problems that we have. And if there are any architects in the room, uh, there was a, there's a wonderful um, essay by Leger called The Wall, the Architect, the Painter. And he just says, my dear architect friends, we are waiting at the foot of the stairs. We are waiting for your commands. You know, painting was put on earth to, to uh, fill the emptiness that you're creating. Uh, that was already the case in 1915. He was a very close friend, lifelong, of Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier never used him properly. Um, so the question of um, once you get beyond a certain scale, you're no longer producing an easel painting. You're producing something between a wall and an altarpiece. And, uh, um, so let's have another one. Yeah. So this is Hussein. Slightly a falling man, slightly untypical Hussein. In a way, the nearest he comes to Tyre. Yeah. yeah, and another one. The, um, so that's the, the 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 huge contrast that I think he must have felt strongly when he first saw the. We can, he can say more about this, but when he first saw the sort of signboard paintings of Boupin, which were also the first Boupins that I saw. Um, and which aren't, which aren't altarpieces. They're, they're sort of more like signboards than altarpieces. But they're, they're the kind of precision, the kind of um, un, unhesitant um, um, depiction uh, makes them diametrically opposite in aesthetic to, to, to the, 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 the aesthetic of the progressives. Another one? And so, I mean, I think the Iranian cafe, which is in a way, the first mature or, it's a very memorable picture. I've always remembered this picture. I, I'm not even sure if I like it, but it is memorable. Um, and uh, the stylization is there, but he manages to get a, a specificity too. And another one. But why, why would you say that you're not sure? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, why would you say that you're not sure that you would like it? I mean, one of what, what well, are the reasons? funny enough, seeing it in the life, it has this funny um, textured surface, mm -hmm. which, which he, I think in his early oil, oil paintings, mm -hmm. he was doing things that I find rather repellent in paint, mm -hmm. what a friend of mine would call paint abuse. <laughs> Whereas he later becomes a very uh, mm -hmm. elegant and suave oil painter. Mm -hmm. But he, he, it's, he's putting things on with a palette knife or something, or, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe to try and give it materiality. Yeah, but in yeah. fact, I mean, for me, uh, I mean, it's it's one of my favorite paintings, and I think it's also um, a favorite uh, amongst uh, you know various different constituencies as well. In fact, uh, because I think there's there's something about 
the central figure who looks extremely solid, like a figure out of Diego Rivera's Mexican murals, uh, but and but yet, out of, sorry, out of what? Uh, out of Rivera's Mexican murals, like uh, an yes, inflated yes, yes, body. Yes, yeah. And yet, there's something very spectral about him, especially because of the kinds of texture that Sudhir, you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the texture with which Sudhir treats the body. So this kind of very gritty, chalky, uh, you know, surface is what actually is 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 what Bath uh, would call the punctum of the painting. Because mm -hmm. normally, when you think of an Irani cafe, you're thinking of conversations, and all the conversations actually go back into, uh, you know, they, they turn into a reflection in the in, in the mirror. You know, and in and and at the center is this figure, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, who 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 feels extremely solid and concrete, and yet somehow uh, you feel as if uh, it's it's a ghost or a specter, you know. And and I think that 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 aspect to his work, and especially uh, it's it's really early days. This is 1977, yeah. yeah. So it's around the same time with your uh, dhakka. Uh, yeah. You know, and again, you have the same kind of, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, for me, and, and what I really like about Sudhir's work, even if you look at the, the first level, where we have um, a work like Chair, for instance, somewhere, just when you think that there is a kind of semi-realist uh, painting, he will suddenly add impasto, yeah. you know, just very, very, very subtly, in a very subtle manner. So, I mean, you know, when, when you're looking at Sudhir's works, you know, on the one hand, it looks very legible, uh, like you know it, you can read it, and then again, suddenly there's some kind of disruption there which uh, distances mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. from it or makes you or provokes you into thinking further. And I suppose on another level, it's also very striking just the whiteness, the overall yes. whiteness, yeah. that that's what one partly remembers. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question here, which you'll, you'll need. that. I, because I missed out, obviously, on the Give dialogue, um, but you, you've, you've published these two pictures side by side. What can you say? A bit, is it to do with flatness, partly? That what, what, what you, what if you like, what you got from Give? What, you, what is the affinity with Give Patel? I, I, I just like you to. I mean, Give and I have had such a long relationship that at, at many levels uh, there has been. He was almost the the main person uh, with whom I was talking and who was looking at my work. So uh, the, the fact that these two were published together, of course, has nothing to do with that, but uh, gives use of, uh, again, of impasto, as Nancy was saying, and especially in his railway platform works, you know, the early works earlier to this was something that I was very attracted to, the way in which he was applying paint, the way in which he was mixing paint on the palette. It, they were very monochromatic, but still there was this element of uh, chroma within those surfaces. Mm -hmm. So this, this element of applying by uh, palette knife, I think partly, of course, it's like emulating Akbar Padamsi at some level. And, uh, and also, along with that, there is a kind of rubbing over, you know. So what I used to do is actually apply the paint, white uh, paint uh, with a palette knife, create a certain texture, and then after it dries to lay a very light glaze over it. And that was almost the uh, most important thing for me, that glaze, which uh -huh. brought out that kind of uh, surface, you uh -huh. know. So it was something like uh, what old masters would do at one level, but at a, uh, not uh, not playing the texture in accordance with the actual uh, kind of uh, shape of the arm or shape of the thing, but making it a little more abstract. And and I think Eve does that a lot, uh, not with the, necessarily with the palette knife, but with his brush also. That he works against the shape, the outside shape of a form. You know, like uh, like here for the tree, or you know, so his work, his paint surfaces, his paint uh, and color coloring is going against, in a sense, the outside form of that. So something like that, I think, mm -hmm. is probably what we've. Do you think this? Let's have another one. Let's have another. Oh ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I said this the other day, but 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 just to say that. The, the very heavily formalized elements, again with lots of texture, 
And the, 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 the photograph is rather, the, the, you know that they couldn't get this picture from Bhopal. It, the picture was withdrawn by Bhopal at the last moment, so it's pity not, but it, it's much bigger than the reproduction that's shown in the show. It's really quite a big picture, something like six foot. Six yeah. foot, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and it has, it's heavily textured. But in the middle of it is this, in a sense, very directly painted single figure. And I think the singularity of that figure, like the Irani hmm. uh, restaurant figure, you know, is part of what it's about. It's about one person through whom the city, I mean, to call it the city, and then to have really a picture with one person turning his back on the city or closing his eyes on the city or whatever as he sips his tea is, is uh, it's interesting. As a, mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. And I, I just thought it would be helpful to see a boo pen beside that. And we'll have one more show. This is Man Eating Jalebi, which has ended up in London, actually. N another one. Leger, the, the moment when Leger abandoned whatever you like to call it, formal, formal um, language, although he's still, in, he was a friend of Mondrian, and he's incorporated a bit of Mondrian, he's embedded the figure in a Mondrian, in effect. But the, the, this tubular, this tubular um, um, uh, tubular idiom, obviously shading into machine idiom. Nevertheless, somehow out of that, he's able to hold on to the idea of a, of a, a, a rather vivid figure, a memorable yes. figure. And he's been looking at Henri Rousseau, which Boupin Kakar mm. also looked at. And so there's, that, something of that moment, and I see it in lots of early 20th century artists, and, and later too, where they, they, they have to find a primal, in order to retrieve the figure from the form, the whatever, the idea of, the idea of pure form, mm -hmm. they, have to, they have to go back into an almost childlike figure. Um, so the idea of retrieving, somehow retrieving a single um, bare presence out of forms, I think is, is, is relevant to Sudia at this point. And another one, please. One, one more slide. Slide, please. Uh, and you see, I think there are elements in that column, for instance, still of Leger, and even in the chimney, you know, the, the tubular, the tubular form continues out of Leger into a sort of realism. I mean, a much more, much more realism than Leger would ever do, because it's, to it's tonally, it appears to be tonally continuous. But I think he's thinking about language the whole time in this picture, which is called um, street play. Um, people, people keep saying that the figure is like a crucifixion figure, but funnily enough, I don't, maybe, maybe he does, I regard it as more like a, a, a lamentation figure at the crucifixion. Um, but uh, anyway, so, and I, I, my guess is that this is more than any other, perhaps the, the picture that sparked off Ranji Toscote's um, description of the complicit observer because that's exactly what he is here. Um, at this point, let me just say that, that um, in an interview a few days ago, December the 22nd, he said, that, he said something interesting. He said, different traditions give you different ways of structuring reality. You see, so I think that's a very interesting observation that, that, that he, uh, and Bupen would have said something very similar, that you, by referring to a certain tradition, you are also... Now, I don't know if we can nail what tradition that... I mean, I think it's a very original painting. And it, um, it, it, I, do, I don't think... It, I mean, I think it's Italian, if it's anything. Yes. I think... <laughs> In fact, uh, the, uh, the, the figure with the uh, outstretched arms comes from Piero's... Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. Uh, from the death of Adam. Cycled. The death of Adam. Yes. 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 Yes, yeah. yes. 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 So it's very Italian in that sense. Yeah. And and the spacing also of uh, the division of the space. Before we had the internet, if one mentioned an artist, you know, we, 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 it was very hard to. But uh, an old dealer I used to know, he used to say, "Who is his father and who is his mother?" <laughs> and and so you know, to some extent, Leger 
Leger is there and <laughs> Piero is there. <laughs> um, so once again, I just want to emphasize the difference between the progressives, that generation, and this other generation. And uh, I'll quote Ranji Toscote. With its now entrenched transcendentalist assumptions, that establishment, okay, the, 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 the establishment that to some extent was by now represented by the Bombay progressives, that establishment would not countenance the representation of the immediate and the local. There was no place in its galleries for life in the street. So I think consciously the street becomes a theme. I, I don't think there are any other Indian painters of that moment that are really dealing with the street. It's, it's actually quite an unusual option. It's not a very frequent option among serious English artists. The, that was part of what, why, why I identified strongly with... with I, I, both of us dr have drawn quite a lot in the street. I, I often do. Um, so anyway, and it's yeah, it's it's it's, in, it's interesting that you brought that up about uh, very few artists at that time were actually uh, you know feeding off the street, you know as as their raw material. But I was also thinking about Gulam Muhammad Sheikh's uh, revolving roots, yes. uh, which was also around uh, the yes. early uh, early 80s, yes. and then um, Bhupen's uh, Guru Jayanti would have also been it's uh, also around. It's almost exactly around. the same time. But again, but, but again these are different uh, ways in which realism gets calibrated. Mm -hmm. So between factuality and fantasy, uh, you know, so revolving roots, which is again one of my favorite Gulambai painting. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, there are fantastical chimerical creatures. And of course, space is completely vertiginous. Is that revolving roots? No, no, I, no. I'm talking about uh, Gulam yes, yes. yeah, yeah, I'm talking about revolving, revolving roots. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So where space is vert vertiginous, and you know, I mean, uh, it's 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 uh, you you really don't have any purchase. You don't have any single vantage point from which you can look at that painting. And you yourself, you know, you're, you you feel as if you're in a kind of merry-go-round, being taken around, uh, you know, that work. Uh, and as against that, when you look at this work, for instance, uh, it's it's uh, you know it, there's the, the spatial configuration of this work is 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 it's almost di diagrammatic, as you were saying earlier. You know, it's it's zoning of spaces. But again, within that zoning of spaces, uh, what what Sudhir does is something very subtle, which is the space is zoned out, but then you have the space is not really the space. The space is actually a reflection. So if, if you look at if you look there. Uh, again, you know, I mean, you do not really see the bus, but you actually see a reflection of the bus. It's almost like, you know, you're seeing something in the mirror. Is it there or not there? Absolutely. You know? And the artist is there in the pillar or standing behind it, uh, you know, is the witness who's looking at this street play. And again, the street play is as actually the action of the street play gets cut. You know, there's a planar cut, so you're actually seeing it again being split. And the car again, which is moving from DN Road, uh, arcades to the mill lands, again being split. Because, because what you actually are seeing here is a crisis of the artists who, uh, who this is already early 80s, so Sudhir is socialized in Marxism uh, in, the, in the early 70s um, when he's studying at AFMC in Pune. And on the one hand, he's receiving a kind of colonial pedagogical art education at Abhinav Kala Mandir, where, the, where they have these hobby classes. And on the other hand, he has uh, friends who are Marxist activists. So that becomes his first uh, uh, you know, I mean, introduction uh, into questions related to dialectical materialism. And then very early on, in almost less than a decade, he's already thinking about the role that you know, ideology plays in art. So the relationship between art and ideology. And wh wh what I really love about this work is that uh, it, th there is no simple binary between art and ideology. In fact, what you have with the figure of the artist and the pillar is a sense of doubt, suspicion, disquiet, uh, you know. And for me, in, in a painting which in a way looks extremely stable and it's diagram, even if it's uh, split, it's still diagrammatically been sort of uh, you know, zoned out. And yet, uh, wh what you actually take away from the work is a sense of disquiet and doubt. And, and that, that ambiguity is again something that I really uh, relate to. But Surya, yeah. we, were, we were talking earlier about how, how by comparison with Sheikh, 
let's say, which is a real kaleidoscope. Although this is really, it is fragmented, that, you know, just as you said, but actually the impression is of stability. Mm -hmm. And I think that he never loses that stability. He doesn't actually throw himself into the, the, the male that's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. He doesn't throw himself, but he creates little disruptions. Yes, yeah. You know, that's right. Do you want to, but I yeah. wonder if you'd like to say something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you bring in the word stability because, in fact, uh, Timothy was talking about and, and has said yeah. that uh, the, the finally uh, what you see in my work is a sense of stability. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I hold on to as, as an important uh, kind of you know, place to reach uh, through my work, you know, through whatever one is doing with, towards completion, to reach a certain kind of stability. And that could be both uh, a, tra a trap and it could be both, as, as Tim says, that, uh, you know, not to push the disquiet further enough, not to push the disquiet in directions that really break open the structure of the work. But, uh, my predilection is towards retaining and, and as you said, just introducing those s small disruptions, uh, you know, and, and let the viewer kind of take them as far as he wants rather than <laughs> taking it on, on myself. Next one. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is just another give, give um, um, studio juxtaposition. Yeah. For is that, I, that picture isn't in the show, is it? The it, one is, on? it is. It is. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is. Terrible. But here, one can actually. We were just yeah. saying that, and and give uh, definitely pushes things to the extreme, a uh, lots of times. So mm -hmm. in Give's work, you have all these crushed heads and drowned women's and madmen and eunuchs and things like that. And though I have do have that mad woman, but even there, even in a scene of a riot, I think it's it's not really uh, kind of, you know, breaking loose and so that's that's an element that I value to hold on to. Stability in that sense. Now, although although it's broadly chronologically hung, there is, I mean, it, it, uh, again and again you break the chronology in the hang, don't you? Do, Nancy, do you want to say? Thank you. Uh, no, actually, it's it's not chronologically hung. No. Uh, in fact, um, I'm constantly breaking uh, yeah. the chronological order. And uh, although we had a large number of works, and so we wanted it, uh, you know, I mean, he wanted to have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, these. Uh, almost 200 works, and I respected that, because then Sudhir also gave me the freedom to create the curatorial interrelationships between the works. So I think that also the relationship between a curator and artist is also one of respect and a mutual you know, give and take. So uh, of course, uh, I was quite worried that we would have to, way too many works, but then also I, I, I realized that here is an artist who you know, was having a, a major retrospective for the first time, and th this was his wish. So once I, I accepted the fact that we would have more works. Then I decided that, I mean, I would take, I'd take up this as a curatorial challenge. And the way I curate is almost like, uh, you know, I mean, it's like scoring music, which is that, uh, you, you know, I mean, you, you're really orchestrating everything down to the, f the, 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 the very small notes. And um, uh, every level, actually, uh, I mean, there, there is no labyrinth in this, this show is not a labyrinth actually, so you don't have to really find the thread in the labyrinth as it were. Uh, in a way the show has, is also qu quite diagrammatic and, and in it, it sort of mirrors the way Sudhir works. Because if you look at each level, there is a broad thematic and there, then there are constellation of works. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you are at the lower level for instance, what, uh, because I titled the show Walking Through Soul City, the idea was that I wanted to immediately bring in this question of the metaphysical. Uh, the, 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 sometimes this kind of um, uh, transverse uh, sacred mystery that, that also emerges from his work. And, and the reason to do that was that because most of the times when people look at Sudhir's work, often they sort of see evidentiary material within that work. They, you know, I mean, they, they're trying to fetishize the city through it. So I wanted to bring in another way of reading. That's why right from the beginning, from the title itself, the, the idea was to actually uh, underline the philosophical aspect of his work as well. And therefore, uh, at the very uh, uh, first level, you have a painting which is Enigma. 
mm-hmm. which is the Penrose Triangle. Yeah. So, yeah. so from the very beginning, uh, I have some earlier works like Accident on May Day, which is from his Marxist period, and then you are seeing the Penrose Triangle. So, I immediately create an argument between, uh, you know, this very palpable materialism in his work, and the interplay of that with a philosophical idealism. Mm-hmm. So, at, and at each level, you'll see how the argument, you know, there, 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 are, there are arguments and sub-arguments. So, uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, if, if, you, if you're open to receiving uh, the curatorial plan, just as we are open to receiving how we read a painting, then you can. In fact, we had a curatorial and an artist walkthrough yeah. just uh, yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, sorry to have uh, and we had almost 200 people, and people stayed with us right up to the dome yeah. level, you yeah. know, so. Okay, another one. Yeah, I was only going to say that there are lots of ways of doing the street, and uh, it could have become comedy. This is Red Grooms, early Red Grooms, from uh, what late fifties, I think. You know, right back. It happens to be an American artist I'm I'm sympathetic to, but I don't think I don't think it is. It, it, I don't think that kind of populist art would at all appeal. You see, I think that at some level, Sudhir is deadly serious. You know, he's not, he's not a comic artist in that way. Okay, another one. Uh, and nor, nor is he really, um, I think, uh, about, you know, the solitude and the city that, that, that uh, Hopper invokes. Another one. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I wanted to, I, I don't know if you've got something to say about Akbar on this occasion. I just wondered if I think Akbar has been uh, a major influence, and uh, in the sense, that, and and it's to do. I, I'll point to one particular uh, one particular uh, phase of his, which is the panoramic works that he did in his grey period, and this is somewhat close to that. But for example, in this work, uh, Akbar's aesthetic was to be able to give us, uh, give the viewer within one field, uh, to organize the field in such a way that all the forces in that field come to one one point as such, one point. But in, in the more panoramic views, there is a kind of panning step by step of uh, this, this focus. And then they all add up to something else. So it's actually those works that I think that I greatly value. And in my work, in a sense, I, I try to kind of you know, bring that element of mm-hmm. getting mil- multiple perspectives, multiple views, and yet to bring them to focus and stability, if you like, at one point. You know? So I mean, this is a, a lovely, uh, lo- lovely painting, which the touch uh, that he has brought to it is something that's quite e- ethereal. But would it be fair to say that, um, by and large, touch isn't your thing? Yes, I think <laughs> you'd be right. Yeah. yeah, yes. So, you know, I mean, did you almost have to take a self-denying ordinance on touch? You didn't want that sort of... Um, it's something that I've, uh, that I've aspired to in certain ways, actually. Uh, for example, in the drawings, I'm able to yes, kind of get, yes, get yes. something of that. Yes. Uh, the immediacy of the touch of charcoal and, mm. and mm. paper, and Ranjit has written about that, uh, in, about the drawings. But when it comes to paintings, I, I tend to kind of see them as much more kind of thought through statements. You know, and and not uh, like no mystification. Like, yeah, and yeah. no slips. I, d- I don't want to kind of express myself through slips of tongue, like, but but to really say what I have decided to say, and therefore the touch becomes overlaid with. And yet, uh, when you when we look at um, uh, works from recent years, like from twenty seventeen, your Wadera works, would, would do you think that? Um, there is a difference in the way uh, you, you you treat your figures and the uh, the environment that they occupy. For example, erase, uh, you know, uh, where 
you, you, you are dealing with specters in Iraq as well, and there was a specter in the Irani cafe as well, but the, the specter in Irani cafe is still uh, between so, so, something that is solid and yet disappearing. But in Iraq, what you have is a lot of disquiet uh, and some anger, anguish. Um. Yes, and uh, but I think uh, that it still uh, becomes formulated in a way, as Shrimati said, uh, uh, through a re, uh, kind of working over, mm. you know. So it's it's not like it's and uh, that I say that I continue to have that aspiration. For example, like I love the work of Tintoretto, mm. and and the way in which uh, the backgrounds in Tintoretto and the figures are are you know sketched in uh, with the kind of light touch, and that's something that I've always aspired to, but. You know, it's something that I hold on to, and if I don't actually get there, at least hope that in the in in that aspiration, something in the process, you know, leaks through the work. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of. And I think that something is leaking through in your more recent works, if I may say so. But I mean, you know, I think it's something that you're still working on. So perhaps we should yeah. leave it. Yeah. Okay. One more. Um, this. Remarkable early painting by Baltus, which in some ways is his great masterpiece. Um, he was 25, and this, the, the date is 1935. Um, he said around this time, or supposed to have said, that he was, and by the way, the, the central figure is based on a Piero, della Francesca figure. And I think it, this was a painting that meant quite a lot to you at one point, yeah? Sorry? Love, love, sorry. Um, I think this is a painting that meant quite a lot to Sudia at one point. But Baltus said that he wanted to redo surrealism after the life. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I don't think uh, um, there's much of I don't think there's much of surrealism in Sudia. But but nevertheless, the idea that somehow one might use the life to create something on the verge of allegory. Um, maybe, maybe you take over here. What, what, what was it that grabbed you in Baltus generally? One thing was, of course, the precision with which uh, his figures are drawn and his surfaces are painted. But uh, at, at, at the level of uh, At the level of suggestion, like how much sexuality can you suggest through just a standing figure, for example, you know, or or through hills, or through mountains, and for example, that painting of people's uh, lying down on the side of a mountain, things like that. Apart from his straightforward, uh, more sexual figures, so that is there, and as you say, it's it's like uh, introducing this quiet, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at, at, at a level of uh, a, a very closed surface as almost, you know, that the surface has been, is, it has a certain finish, and yet the disquiet is kind of slowly, uh, uh, kind of through osmosis, comes up to the surface. You know? So that's the kind of one thing I wanted to ask you, which I, I've never have, is that, I mean, in this case, we know that the, that straight back of the white figure mm. is the midpoint of the picture, vertically, and the right underneath the, the head of the little the central figure, the, the one I've, I've called the puppet master, mm. um, is, this, is the horizontal midpoint. Now, are you using measurement at all in your in your compositions? Because mm. you don't talk about that anywhere, as far as I know. Mm. No, for me, it's mostly like instinct. In, it, instinct. It's instinctive. Yes. I, I hoped it was, yes. in a way. Yeah. yeah. So I don't actually, I mean, there are artists, again, like Akbar, who's not exactly measurement, but again, yeah. uh, he's yeah. used yeah. the grid and mathematics in that sense. So for okay. me, that's, that's quite, uh, I mean, somewhere it is, uh, 
I think I trained myself uh, very early on to to look at the golden section and to look at the ways mm. in which mm. uh, old masters were composed. Mm. And I studied a lot of uh, works, even you know, Constable, whatever, and they, they still used the golden mean to cr to produce an absolutely naturalistic looking mm. world. Mm. You know, so that interests me that this this very mathematical kind of formula could, in fact lead to a very naturalistic looking so but my my way of working is mostly instinctual and uh. actually that's very interesting you, you, you brought in the point about uh, your way of working is very in instinctive because uh, i'd like to uh, quote something that timothy hyman says in the bupen kakkar monograph uh -huh. where he talks about how uh, bupen uh, loved lorenzetti's uh, work we get to bring it in uh, oh yeah oh okay yeah. so uh, okay so maybe i, yeah. I can sort of preempt oh. that by All saying right. about how uh, yeah. bupen uh, loved lorenzetti's this 40 foot uh, long mural and and how uh, you you talk about how lorenzetti uh, how how he actually organized space was not through systematic perspectives but actually uh, in a very instinctual manner. Mm, mm, so I think mm. that also sort of, in a way, relates to uh, you, your work and also uh, Bhupen and, and Gulambhai's work yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think we, let's have another one, actually. Let's see where, yeah. And let's have one more. Yeah. So there, there is the Lorenzetti <laughs> cityscape, which, which do, does do this extraordinary feat spatially would be quite impossible within systematic perspective. He, he gets you in there and above it and beyond it. You know, let's have another slide. That's, the whole, that's more or less the whole wall, 46 foot. Um, so the sense, I think that is, has been an inspiration, not only to Sudhir and me and Bupen and Sheikh, but also to Give. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so it-, it I think it, uh, wrote painting. And I was saying the other day that I don't think you'd, be, you'd have great difficulty finding five English painters of any note who were all dead keen on Sienese painting. Uh, so it's, it's an unusual situation. Um, it, it's something to do with the, the tenor of the, this, this generation, what we're looking for. And it relates a bit to the altarpiece thing, the, the comprehend, making a comprehensive world. Another one? And I love this picture. I, I was, I admit, disappointed at first to see that it had been damaged quite badly. And clearly, some of the blueness of that sky has gone. Some of the whiteness of the, this um, construction has also been lost. It, the whole tone has been brought down. But I think for seeing, seeing it for the first time, it would still hold as a remarkable picture. Um, one of his most remarkable, actually, and it is to do with creating a vertical, a vertical pa panorama um, where we are. And, and I, I use the word uplift because, in some sense, one is lifted up yeah, uh, physically, and the the, the 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 stream, the polluted stream, the nulla, is that right? Nulla, um, and uh, right in the middle of the. The, the white construction. There is a very small figure um, shitting into the into the river, into the nulla, um, just um, not very far from the one who's bathing, and not very far from the one who's using it to clean the. <laughs> <laughs> but none of that really. That, that that that's by the way. That's an incidental. But the the the, the general sense is of moving upwards in this exciting way. And I I was interested in what what that construction was. And he made a very interesting response to me. He said that he'd been thinking of a painting, which I probably ought to have made a slide of, by Basavan, where you were both above it and below it. So there's an ambiguity of space. Um, anything you want to say about that? Yes, I think uh, that was a time when Mughal painters were looking at prints that were coming in from the West. And they were trying to emulate, especially in painting buildings and things like that, the perspective that the Western artists uh, had, had evolved. So there was a mixture of, there was a kind of coming together of a traditional Indian perspective uh, of laying a foreground and middle ground and background from lower to top. And then inserted into this were these kind of odd looking 
you know, building shapes. So that, that was a very interesting moment, I think. And, and this coming together of traditions, which creates, uh, in that sense, a disruption, uh, is in fact a, a, a most kind of, uh, you know, it's a very pregnant uh, moment. Uh, when traditions come together like that and each one is trying to accommodate the other in some way. So that was, and, and that's what here, because it is in fact like a miniature uh, uh, kind of uh, lay, you know, from bottom to top. And in that, this. Another one, another slide. This is a great missing dimension to the show. A lot, of, quite a few people I know, it's one of their very favorite of all Sudia's works, and it's again a diptych um, about a childhood. Oh, sorry. Yeah. About a childhood memory. That it wasn't me. <laughs> about a, uh, and again, it's a double decker and a mezzanine world one. And I've, what I've commented on at this point is that you look back and you realise that he's, in a sense, begun to make pictures that virtually have no figure. I mean, there is a figure, one or two, tiny little, a little boy somewhere there, but essentially he's, he seems to have painted some of his most fulfilled pictures without figure. And I think, I think that gave rise to guilt. You know, in a way, the figure is his superego. There's a famous, much quoted quotation where he said, the moment he started in his career as a figure, as a painter, the, the, it was clear to him what painting was about. It was about people. But it isn't about people. <laughs> um, but I think it's a beautiful painting. And, and it's, it, something that's amazing in a lot of Patwadan's work, I think, is that you, they are partly based on photographs, and there is an element of photographic. But he does manage nearly always to transcend that, to make something that is truly felt and intuitive, and not just by the, divide, the formal devices here, but by something in the penetration of space, the feeling of deep space. The, the, uh, I, th I think the connection with uh, uh, Sheikh uh, comes clear here, that, that the idea of a map, that this for me was essentially uh, trying to work out what a map uh, of a, uh, a place where I lived as a child would look like, but a map that was a perceptual map, which, which contained perceptual mm. data, you mm -hmm. know, and not only symbolic data, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. indicated roads and houses and places like that. So my uh, kind of uh, you know, attempt here is to, and that was so in the Pokhran pictures as well, and in the large Pokhran landscape, which is also, and many others where this idea of a map has been very important. Yes, yes, the mapping. Yes. Just remind me the title again, this one. Memory Double Page. Memory, Memory double. double Page. Yeah. Memory Double Page, yeah. It also, uh, on, on, on the one hand, this is a conceptual map, uh, as you said, a perceptual one, but there's also this pattern here. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, all of us have chadars of this kind at home. So the moment uh, you see this, you, when you see this pattern, and this texture, you know it has to do with sleeping and dreaming. So it's, it's like you just about allow that, it could be like a rope bed on top or a, you know, a grill or a jali, and then this. Just this pattern, suddenly there's, there's a little infusion of warmth. You, you're allowing yourself, uh, you know, uh, or, or perhaps you're signifying that, look, this is all a dream, you know, that this is, this is not real, because it isn't. I mean, you know, every road, your, uh, you know, makes a detour and then it leads to nowhere, or it leads to somewhere, but we, we can't actually follow you on that journey. So Sorry, it just occurs to me that, I mean, do you think the radiology has something to do with mapping? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't no, know. I, don't I know. never I thought I, of it. I, it's <laughs> a, it's maybe a false lead. Let's have another one. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is another yeah. very interesting, I think, missing picture, Pokhran, which has this, when you start really getting into it, there is this great, almost, un, I mean, like a cave or a void, in the, right in the middle, this blackness, which isn't really rational. I mean, uh, the parts of this painting are rational. 
And again, it's essentially, apart from the child in the foreground, it's almost empty of figures. It's almost, uh, I mean, some, an assistant, when I was working on this lecture, he said, is it post-nuclear? And he <laughs> thought that even about the previous one, actually. Yeah. He thought he felt yeah. that there was some t something yeah. terrible that happened in that. And probably the title kind of because Pokhran is also the site where India tested its mm -hmm. nuclear devices, mm -hmm. but this Pokhran is not that. So the three figures there are in fact the one figure that's walking up, and you can see the other figure that is down. But there's also a small figure right on top. And what I did have in mind is actually the kind of mapping that happens in Chinese landscape painting where a person, the painter goes for a walk, and then when he paints his picture, it combines the different views that he has gone to uh, and, and brings it together. Uh, uh, and is it the first picture, the first altarpiece made with acrylic, this one? Yes, I think, yeah. because it's 91, yeah. and I, I actually started to paint in acrylics yeah. in, in around 1991. I mean, we probably, that, that would be another thread that one could have in the show, that, that there is some transition from oil to acrylic. And although, I mean, it's not terribly noticeable in reproduction, but physically it is quite noticeable. There is a difference, Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Um, another one? That's an extraordinary picture. The, the slide we have here, I'm afraid, doesn't get the pinkness of the left corner. It's actually quite a strong pink. And you, you do tr transition from a relatively um, muffled light to a very bright, the, 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 the last panel, the fourth panel, is really very much brighter. So, it, it, but it's a remarkable, it really is about a, a journey, that picture. And I know it yeah. took him about a year to paint. It's a journey, I think, uh, both uh, of a day, like starting with early morning to and it's uh, to dusk and it's also the kind of uh, journey of cities so the kind of age of the city which is almost pre pre urban to urbanization and to kind of post post industrial cities and you know so it's it just uh, time in various ways in that sense I probably should have emphasized that something like 10 years lie between those, the last two images. I think Pokhran is... Absolutely, yes. Pokhran, Pokhran is 91. Is this is already... 2000. In, it's into 2000. The, into the 21st century. Yeah. Now, in that period, his superego ran riot, so to speak, <laughs> with, with uh, masses and masses of figures, 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 but not much mapping or panorama or altarpiece. So it, it, that again, we yeah. be another way of structuring. Um, In fact, I think the second level uh, that Nancy has curated has most of those '90s figures. Yeah. Yes. Another one. I love this picture. Um, again, the mezzanine double decker, yes. um, but poignant about the, the way the city is about to change again. This, this clearing that's already been mapped out with um, measurements and so on for a tower, another tower. Um, again, the, 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 when you see it, the, there's a, the pink is much stronger. There's much more pink, both at the top and in the reflection of the water. It makes a big difference. Um, and again, he's most fulfilled without the figure. Mm. <laughs> you, also, you also talk a little bit about cl clearing, the, cl the clearing at the center. Uh, yes. The philosophical resonance of it. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, what, what was on my mind was really uh, the, this, this way in which one encounters areas in, in, in Bombay where suddenly one has seen uh, a, a dense settlement and then all that is cleared up and its space is made. So that is the immediate kind of reference to it. Uh, I was also uh, interested, like for example, uh, we've seen uh, horizontal kind of panoramas and with Nalla, for example, and with town, they were vertical. So this is in a sense bringing these two 
things together. Like there is a movement from bottom to top, uh, and there's also a movement for horizontal. And that, I think, comes somewhere from uh, traveling in Bombay, that when you're, when you're taking a train and traveling, one is, of course, a horizontal passage of, you know, you, you cross, cross one station after another, one suburb after another. But there's also this sense that this is never ending, that this, this city goes on and on. So this, this element of from the bottom, you, you reach one level, then you reach the, the river, then you reach another level, then there's another, maybe, as someone has written, maybe there's another level beyond that. So that sense which also comes in the memory double page, that mm -hmm. you reach a horizon and then there's something else, not just the sky. And, and in I fact, think. it's there in the bylines, too. Yes, yeah. in bylines, too, yeah. 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 Okay, another one. Lower Parel. Um, this is the area where there had been the mill world but already dying. Yes, yeah. yes, more or less dead now. I, I think it's got very powerful spatial sensations when one sees it in the life, even more than in reproduction. Um, when I first saw it, I think I wrote him rather a rude response about how the figures were like, too like sort of Kellogg's cornflakes, um, <laughs> um, you know, generic figures. I, 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 I probably would, would uh, back down from that a bit, but. But, 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 I mean, that's the danger with all social realism. And, and it is there in quite a lot of the paintings for me that they aren't quite dis distinctive enough, which they are in the first picture. I mean, the, f the city is a very distinctive person. And so I think is, is mm. some of the figures in, so there's some way in which he himself pushed towards a generic figure at a certain point. Maybe not wanting to be too, too caricatural or all, all those possi other possibilities that could easily have come in. Yeah, I think one when, when has tried to, uh, uh, you know, with, with individual figures and when one is working uh, with photographs, one, one gets a lot of information and gets a lot of figures and one takes them and tries to transform them. But for example, the person in uh, whose back we see with the yellow shirt and, and, and that gesture of like, you know, pushing his ear in front. Now, that's the kind of uh, detail that I would like to introduce in more and more figures, where there's that gesture which just says something more than what it mm -hmm. just is, you know? And that would give the figure, or that would give, or it happens, for example, someone pointed out in, in another painting, which is called uh, uh, a Station Road, in which one person's hand is across a, a woman's face, and it's, it's almost touching her lips. Mm -hmm. So this kind of gestural play or this kind of gestural thing where the gestures transcend the immediate uh, kind of meaning of their, you but know. Is this one of the more specific ones? Is there less of, um, col of montage or collage in this space than some of the others? There is, in the sense that the bridge uh, and the and, uh, uh, mill are not really in the same place. Neither well, they're is, not in the same no, place. They're, not okay. uh, they're, they're close by, but they're not exactly no, in the no, same place. Okay. And the bridge is much more uh, opened out in the sense it's, uh, uh, there's a right angle uh, with in the middle. So it's, it's actually much more closed mm -hmm. in that sense. So it's like opening out something. Uh, so it's a very so convincing and interesting space you've created, I think. Okay, another one. Okay, so we're back to that. Um, I just want to say that I had a double take with this picture in that I'd been about 10 minutes on my chair admiring it, and I suddenly saw that the figure on the bottom left is Bupankaka. <laughs> I really hadn't seen it. I don't know, and I think quite a lot of people don't see it. Uh, and once, you know, then it becomes very poignant because it's about four years after his death, 2007, mm -hmm. the, the painting, this painting. And I guess that Sudhir, like me, was missing Bhupan quite, <laughs> quite strongly and, and grieving. And uh, the, it was Bhupan who, le to some extent, had led Sudhir into the bylanes. Any, anything to be said about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I started the picture, it was not actually uh, that Bhupan wasn't in it, in a sense. But as I was painting these figures in the bottom, it suddenly ha appeared to me. I mean, initially that person didn't have that white hair, but 
but the stance of the figure suddenly suggested to me you know, this, and then I, I, I made it into yeah, a homage to Bupin in a sense. Did you know from the beginning that we, at the point of joining the diptych you would have those two diff slightly different blues? Was that one of the ideas from the beginning or? That's one thing that I've kind of, uh, it's, 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 it's part of uh, the way in which I work on diptychs or multi-panel works that I, I always start with uh, different colors on adjacent panels or different tonalities on adjacent panels. So I, I break the continuity and then work towards a, a certain continuity and then leave, leave it just short of it really becoming continuous. So that's, one might say, a kind of strategy. So at some point, one realized that this, this is something that is better than, you know. I'd just like to add, uh, what you were just saying, you know, leaving it just a little dis discontinuous, uh, the fact that you were stitching different planes uh, and spaces together from the very beginning, even before, you know, we started uh, having Photoshop, uh, and I've always found that very fascinating, that you know, at, at that time you must have physically taken photographs or tracings and then put them together and then uh, you know worked out uh, a, a possible composition. Could you talk mm. about the before and after of Photoshop? Yes, I mean, uh, it was it was probably just more uh, labor uh, intensive earlier because I, I used to do the same thing in a sense. I, I used to use. Uh, photographs uh, or sketches. Uh, I used to use tracing paper to lay these different things onto each other and, and to work out a kind of uh, collage of uh, coming together. For example, memory double pages mostly through that kind of tracing paper layering. Mm. But once Photoshop becomes available and you kind of, then you realize that you can do all this, uh, you know, and, and try many more uh, uh, kind of possibilities with it. So, but they're, they're very, one has to be very careful, of course, you know. So, so you have to edit uh, a lot out of those photographs. So for color, for example, I usually edit completely out, make them monochromatic, so that that doesn't impinge on what I'm working towards. Uh, and of course, one has to be able to change perspective and, and directions of those individual uh, segments. Uh, so behind that is a kind of structure that is in your mind that you have a sketch of, in fact, in most cases. So you have an abstract sketch of the way in which forces are going to work within that space. You know, So horizontal, vertical, oblique, whatever, the, the flow of it. So you have an abstract sketch and then your photographs are kind of coming in to fill in spaces and give them some more concrete uh, you know, existence. I, I think at this point we should hand over to the remaining audience. <laughs> but, uh, but I just want to say, one thing I didn't say is I wanted to thank Shalini Sony for being so kind to bring me here and uh, uh, make, make it all happen. The, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We have the lights in the... If you have any questions, yes, please. I was just curious. I was wondering if we could consider, and specifically you, Sudhir, if um, you know the let's say the between the 70s and the 90s, we were seeing a lot of 35 mm films, right? And you were uh, quite a keen enthusiastic about uh, um, just the cinema as, as such. So. I was wondering how much of that has come into your work, you know, the, the perspective. For example, the crane shot where you go from, um, from the bottom up or from up to down, the horizon line also changes. And so, I mean, that's one example, but so many other aspects of the cinema as such, particularly not video, but the cinematic lens. And you, you perhaps didn't conscious, you weren't conscious of it, but just thinking about your work now, later, I mean, because much of, much, many of your images 
have that like double page, you know, the scale changes minutely. The, you know, the, the tree which is on, on your right is a little bigger, a little bigger, just a little bigger on the left. And this is very much the, the zoom and the um, uh, crane shot, you know, that can happen in a moving image. So, wanted to ask you about yes, that. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I was greatly influenced by the way in which uh, film structures uh, movement, you know. And uh, for example, focus, as you said, uh, one of the clear kind of memories uh, when I realized if I'm standing at the platform uh, of the real platform and, and, and I'm talking to someone on, on this side and suddenly my attention goes to someone across on the other platform and my focus changes there. The size of that person and if, if this is recorded uh, in the same way as you know, what size is this head? And I, I was interested because in Italian painting, for example, there are lots of times when there's a very large head and there's uh, the, a figure of the size of the person's nose far off. So this kind of thing is always happening. But here, when one's attention goes to a person across on the other side of the platform, that person suddenly becomes much larger, you know? So he comes ahead. So this kind of way in which size changes uh, with one's focus is something that one continuously finds in cinema. Another thing that is more recent in my work, the way in which a camera would move uh, within uh, an interior, you know? For example, the way in which it would move from one room into a passage and then into another room and turn around and then look back into the passage, something like that. Now that, that the, the structure or structuring of this space in that way, or slightly tilted upwards to include the ceiling, and if it's going straight ahead, then the bend in the ceiling, that will happen, and that bend is something that Timothy has worked with very much, that the whole world in that sense is, is bent, it's warped, you know? So that warp that happens in space is again something that I think, just seeing film, and quite rightly, it's not consciously something that was, but it has, it has come into the work through the experience of those those films, surely. Especially Erase, um, the, the painting Erase. Uh, and in fact, there are other paintings also in the dome, which uh, are from the from 2017 onwards, when he's uh, showing the artists in the studio, the interior works. That especially is, it's, it's like putting a camera on a trolley and then moving from one room to another. Uh, have the next slide. I, I cut it back out. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no, just no. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, the question is about uh, on one hand, about specific portraits uh, in Patwardhan's work, like there are many, uh, like like as if Bupin uh, in this picture was a cameo uh, kind of, but uh, there are like mother, father, other family members. Uh, then there are artists like KG and Parshikar and we uh, also have uh, Timothy Hyman in one picture. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> Tim's World is the ti title. Ha. Uh, uh, the, the, the kind of attributes, uh, as in a, a typical portrait, uh, and the, the, the kind of memory uh, element, as in uh, Patwardhan's other work, and it it is most of the times. I mean, a, a very kind of a very very digested, very uh, uh, thought upon, uh, very contemplated kind of a memory in in uh, say uh, uh, the work uh, where Palchikar sits on a. Hmm. 
and but in Tim's world, it's more joyous, more kind of uh, I don't know. It, it's it's rather more informative, or so, I mean something. There is something different in these. What what I mean? How could one kind of sense the? Uh, I think Tim's World was essentially a kind of celebration of, after I read uh, his book, uh, Making uh, the World, the World New Made. Yes, the book is here. It's absolutely fascinating book. And there were so many uh, essays on artists that I knew, but also essays on artists that I did not know too well. And it was a kind of celebration of this uh, person who, in a small London flat uh, with his writer wife, has invited all these people into his world and has created this kind of, uh, you know, where uh, Bartos and Bupin and uh, Bonard and all of them, Kitai, you know. Uh, so it's, it's this family, you know, it's, it's a kind of family portrait for Tim and Judith uh, with, with all these, uh, the celebration of all these friends that have enlivened and enriched his wife. And he, through the book, has enriched us in that sense. So it's a celebration for that. So that is the reason that it's very different from something like abstractionist, which is a kind of self-questioning, a questioning about abstraction and realism, something that a teacher has said about my work and then I'm questioning that teacher's statement. Uh, and uh, with portraits of mother and parents, of course, it's again different, or father's story. They become very uh, autobiographical and personal. Well, this is like between friends. <laughs> so that's one little Thank you, Sudhi. Uh, just one, one more thing I wanted to add about Tim's world. And I may be wrong, but I think perhaps you were also mirroring something of uh, Tim's own paintings, which is that he, he loves uh, this, this notion of the curved world, you know, where everything is sort of moving in a kind of circular fashion, some, where, it, where things are more vertiginous, if I'm not mistaken. So I think perhaps some aspect of that also comes true in Tim's yeah. world. Yeah. This kind of circular kind of movement. There's a kind of circular movement from the table on to the ceiling and mm -hmm. back. Very true. Thank you. This has been. Thank you. This has been a real, really a very interesting evening. And for the last two, three decades, when I've been looking at Sudhir's work, <coughs> it's always for me about the complexity of space and time complexity of light uh, from dark to light and many complexities which have created his framework. Now, I would like to, if you don't mind, talk about one painting uh, where I can tell you what I mean by what I've just said. So if we can go to that painting which is in three parts where the theater uh, uh, the person, the enactment is there. Street, 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 street enactment. Yeah. I'll tell you how I see this work and how this has made me uh, look at many of your works in this context and of course in a much more complex context. So if we can go to that uh, painting. Yeah, this one. Now, these three sections with the pillar, of course, uh, dividing and this white line dividing it. When I look at the right section, uh, although the right section has arches, it's different from the arches in the center. There's a whole different ambiance, but the central figure of the actor goes across both those time frames and spatial frames. So the right panel comes towards me and maybe goes behind me. And 
gives a sense to me of the past. The central panel gives me the impression of being in the present. And then the car connecting the central panel with the one on the left. That is a receding kind of perspective. So the first one is something that comes towards you and goes behind you. The second stays with you as a, as a moment in present time. And the third one recedes away from you as maybe the future in terms of time. Now this is maybe a very simplistic way of saying it, but um, and you see the car goes through the present and the future, the actor goes through the present and the past. So time, space. Now coloring, you know, uh, on the left side it's dark. Uh, um, in the center it's like the present, um, a moment in uh, of, of, of the day. And in the right again, the, the day or night feeling is not defined. So there are many aspects of this work which in most of your structuring of space and time, I find exists because, you know, unlike other uh, works that uh, show the integrity of space and time and perspective, you do not have that continuity in terms of space, time and perspective. Your structuring, even when you talk about the vertical structuring, I mean the different planes, for me each of those planes represents not only just a physical difference in those planes, uh, but a different moment in time, a different moment in space. It reminds me a lot of uh, what Tayyab does with his diagonal in different ways. He takes his, the structure of his diagonal and as you rightly said, Akbar does with the structure of his lines and uh, tonalities because I did some work with Akbar in terms of tonalities and color and black and white. So I, I, can that kind of thinking but this works similar but not similar in the sense that your imagery is very different from either of those. And the people, uh, now you, when you take space, time, image, light, and then bring people, you know, that adds yet another complexity to the kind of work that we see in your painting. And in most of the work that I've seen, I find this, you know, uh, looking out of your, the window, uh, even the last picture, those three uh, perspectives, you know, the middle is dark, the right is much brighter, and the left is another uh, distance. So this play of space, time, color, light, darkness, you know, the one with the uh, river going around the s city, the right side, uh, as, as you were saying, I was saying, this is the day and proceeding into night, and then, you know, disappearing. So this interesting way in which you play with space and time has always fascinated me. Thank you. Thanks. Nisha, that's very perceptive. I'd like to, uh, there's a very beautiful uh, essay, which is right now in Marathi, uh, by a friend of mine who, who has written on the work that you have, which is building a home and exploring the world, in which he specifically talks about the uh, concepts of space and time in my work. So I'll, I'll definitely have it translated and send it to you. <laughs> Shall we leave it there? Uh, th thank you so much, Tim, and also Sudhir, for this lovely conversation. Um, I think uh, we've all been witnesses to something quite momentous today. Uh, and uh, thank you for being such a patient audience. Uh, and uh, we will meet again and again because there are lots of different events which accompany this retrospective. I can see Sudhir already feeling exhausted. <laughs> uh, yeah. But thank you for being with us. Uh, you know, even on the walkthrough, we had around 200 people and you've come back again and again. So yes, thank you so much. On behalf of the Guild, I would like to thank you all for being with us over here, and especially our speakers, Timothy Hyman, Sudeep Atwardhan, and Nancy Adajanya. Our next event is on 15th Jan, which is Bombay Metaphor, and it is in collaboration with Avid Learning. So I would like to invite you all for the same. Thank you once again, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>